Greetings. Um, first of all, uh, Father Andrew Lauf. At least that's how uh, uh, we pronounce his surname in. Uh, that's quite right. Uh, yeah. That's quite right. Uh, and greetings, everyone um, who will be watching this uh, this recording. Uh, for um, the audiences that uh, have been have become already familiar with uh, this uh, series of conversations, you know that the topic is. Uh, while well, not advers advertised as such, uh, but the topic is uh, how to make sense of, uh, of the sciences within a Christian setting. And uh, Father uh, Andrew Lauf uh, was kind enough to uh, agree to uh, uh, talk to me and so of course, uh, indirectly to uh, you, the audience. And uh, uh, I'm certain that this will be a true festival of uh, uh, mind and heart. I'll begin uh, by uh, introducing uh, Father uh, Andrew's uh, profile uh, at the British Academy. He's a fellow of the British Academy. Uh, see here his photo and uh, uh, the profile uh, presenting uh, him as um, uh, an expert in the history and theology of the Christian church in late antiquity and in the Byzantine Empire, and also uh, an expert in modern Eastern Orthodox theology. Uh, he was elected uh, a fellow in 2010. Uh, of course, those of you who do not know the biography of Father Andrew uh, can get here uh, a gist of it, uh, and uh, also uh, uh, highlights of, of his uh, impressive uh, career. Uh, and uh, I also prepared a link to his profile at uh, the University of Durham, uh, where he served as professor of patristic and Byzantine studies, currently being an emeritus professor. Uh, again, uh, a bit more of his biography, research interests, uh, and also uh, a, a select list of publications, of, of course, those who are familiar with uh, uh, the uh, impressive productivity of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, Father uh, Andrew uh, know that that list uh, uh, doesn't give him any justice. He's uh, produced so much uh, from uh, uh, his own uh, volumes to uh, edited volumes to uh, uh, tons of articles and, and, and book chapters, also his editorial uh, uh, work. Uh, I uh, have to confess that I met him long ago, long before we met uh, uh, face to face in 2018 in Durham, um, in Romania as a doctoral student, uh, I was preparing a, a doctoral thesis uh, on St. Maximus the Confessor mainly, uh, but with a view to how uh, a Maximian scholar would uh, uh, handle uh, the anthropic cosmological principle. So uh, I was uh, interested in uh, uh, making sense of the anthropic principle from the viewpoint of, uh, of St. Maximus and also Father Dumitru Staniloi. And it is uh, uh, during those uh, uh, studies and during uh, my doctoral research that uh, I uh, found um, uh, Father Andrew's uh, amazing book on, uh, uh, on St. Maximus, where he also in, uh, introduced a number of uh, translations uh, published with Routledge and uh, uh, articles and, and chapters. That was uh, my first uh, adventure with Father Andrew. And, I was fortunate enough to see him from far away, actually, <laughs> uh, while he presented in Bucharest uh, uh, in the uh, palace of the Patriarchate, he presented to a huge room of uh, hundreds and hundreds of, uh, of people sitting and some of them standing uh, a lecture on uh, uh, the Neopatristic Manifesto. I remember 
uh, you talking about uh, Father George Florovsky and, and, and others. It, it has been amazing, but I was a, a newbie at the time and I was so shy, I, I, I didn't dare to uh, come and introduce myself to you. That was long ago in the 90s somehow. <laughs> Um, anyway, uh, time passing, time flying, I, uh, uh, I managed to read more and more, uh, drawing uh, immensely uh, uh, on uh, the wisdom and the scholarship of, uh, of Father Andrew Louth. Um, greetings, once again, uh, I'm honored to uh, have you as, uh, um, as my guest. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I, I can't be there or you can't be here uh, to uh, sh uh, share in some conviviality, but let's uh, assume that uh, uh, the Holy Spirit will, will make this uh, conversation uh, uh, full of uh, um, fruit, uh, spiritually, intellectually, uh, for us and for all, uh, for all those who will be watching this recording. Thank you once again, uh, Father Andrew. Um, could you please say something about yourself be, uh, before we, uh, we roll the ball? Uh, um, I didn't mention the fact that uh, you are also uh, the shepherd of uh, the very vibrant uh, uh, community of Orthodoxy in, in Durham. Uh, would you like to share uh, with us uh, anything else? Um. <laughs> Um, I'm not very good talking about myself, really, um, but um, um, well, what you just mentioned, I mean, I could, I could go on for a long time about that. We've, we're, we're, we're trying to, um, and will, I think, by the end of the year, have our own church in Durham, which will be amazing, um, a place that you can point to and say, this is where the Orthodox worship. It's been a terrible, long um, struggle and um, and the credit really goes to my junior priest, um, another Romanian, um, Father Justin Micho, who's really um, um, been the hands-on person getting all this done. Um, I don't know. Um, I find it very difficult to speak when people ask about you know, my sort of academic career, as it were, as if it was something that was planned. It didn't really happen like that at all. Um, there were just various issues that came up that I felt were very important. Um, and um, so, for instance, my first book, Origin of the Christian Mystical Tradition, that came out of um, discussions in the 70s in Oxford about the, revi the, 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 the revision of the theology tripe, the, the, tripe um, the theology school, as it's called, the, 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 the syllabus. And I kept on saying that it's terribly important, if we're approaching the fathers, it's very important not just to look at their arguments and not just to treat them as it were background to the councils. These were men of, uh, men of faith and men of prayer. And we won't understand them if we just look at their um, arguments about sort of prosopon and hypostasis and usia and so on. Um, there's so much more to them than this. Um, and that this week we ought to find some way of incorporating this um, into the into the syllabus so that students find out about about this dimension, this side of, of them. And so the, the, I, in those days, it may be still the same in Oxford, you could lecture on what you wanted to. It's just up to you because the lectures are not part of the syllabus. The syllabus is 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 taught through tutorials, and the lectures are there to introduce you to either your enthusiasms or to introduce people to very very elementary lectures. For instance, I think are, are very helpful in this context, so that people, students get a grasp of the names and places and that sort of thing. So I gave this course called Origins of the Christian Mystical Tradition. Um, which eventually was called from Plato to Dennis because it starts with Plato and the first third of the book at least uh, is concerned with non-Christians leading up to Philo and then um, um, or rather leading to Plotinus via Philo and then um, it, it moves on to Christian material and um, and it was it received in all sorts of interesting ways. Michael Ramsey, for instance, was very, very kind about it and regarded it as a, a very brave study in Christian Platonism, which is one way of looking at it. 
Um, I'm not sure that what I thought I was doing, but certainly. And then, um, and then I, I just simply responded to requests. And then sometime in the 80s, I read right through, instead of just picking out bits of, um, John and Damascus is um, on the Orthodox faith. And I was tremendously excited about what was seen to be going on in this. It's, it's very, it's, it, we treat it as being sort of normal, but it isn't, there's nothing normal about it at all. It's, from one, seven, four, just stop it. He's not very good at being told to shut up. Anyway, um, and um, the um, I. Oh, I know it's in the later. I think I knew it was from. Yeah, you know, so, from uh, uh, John of Damascus. John, the thing about John of Damascus is that it's not it, 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 bits of it. Say, you know, it's it's so influential. You think this must be an obvious sort of way of presenting the faith. Um, it was the, it was the, one of the textbooks in the, in the Latin Middle Ages, alongside um, Peter Peter Lombard, and Peter and it's modelled on Peter Lombard um, and all things like that. Very interesting. But I, the more I read about it, the more I began to think that there's there's a lot more to it than this. And that the first thing one needs to do is to put it in its own context, which is not the Latin Middle Ages, but it's 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 Palestine just after the Islamic conquest. Um, and so, I, but then I thought, but then you see, hmm, I was asked to write, do something on Dionysus the Areopagite, and I thought, well, that's a good idea, because Dionysus is one of the people who is so much, is enormously important to John. And then I was asked if I would contribute to um, early church fathers. And so I said, yes, I'll do Maximus, because he was the other person I wanted to find out about. And I wrote that book on Maximus, um, which has been extraordinarily successful. Um, I'm told by the general editor it's the only book in that series that continues to sell. Um, which is, I can't understand really because there are some. Oh, I, I understand perfectly why, and and, and, and I used I used it every time I I, I taught uh, uh, lectures on, on Saint Maximus. I used it uh, uh, with my students and uh, very successfully so. Well, thank you, yes. But anyway, it's been very successful. And then you see, having done, having done the Dionysius book and the Maximus book, which were quite different kinds of books, one to another, I, I then decided I would settle on, work out what I thought about John of Damascus. And the, the great thing is that the, the, all the real work, the real work had been done already by Bonifatius Cotter, who spent the whole of his life producing this six volumes of the, the authentic works of John. So it's all there. Um, and the, the idea of, um, there's this kind of stage of scholarship that often gets sort of overlooked, which is actually, actually <laughs> taking advantage of the scholarly work that's already been done in editions. So you can now, as it were, you, you can, you've got a clean account of what he wrote and you can, um, and it, and the book grew out of that, and I found myself thinking a lot about what kind, what what sort of thing theology was. And anyway, um, and it's resulted that your interest in in, in Saint John the Amazon resulted in, in that tremendous monograph. Uh, yeah, yeah. And another another uh, another hit. Uh, <laughs> The market, I, I think, still reverberates. It's actually a, a, a tremendous resource, and it's not only because there isn't uh, too much scholarship dedicated to uh, the legacy of Saint John, uh, but it's truly amazing. I mean, what you manage uh, uh, to do in, in that book, uh, apart from a, a painstaking reconstruction of, of his biography and, and bibliography, uh, you manage to, to point out the fact that. Uh, uh, St. John's contributions cannot be discussed, you know, only in terms of uh, some kind of snapshot in time uh, of uh, uh, past wisdom or past patristic wisdom. Uh, there's a lot of creativity there. Uh, and I remember the, uh, the many lenses that, that you used in order to um, uh, 
make sense of, uh, of his contributions. Uh, I, I particularly enjoyed uh, uh, your analysis of, of his canons, liturgical canons, you know, which is something that uh, it, it's so important for, uh, for us uh, Orthodox and uh, we don't have too many uh, analysis of liturgical texts. Yeah, I mean, the, the John of Damascus, the, his, the liturgical side of John is, is something that actually a lot of work had been done already, but nobody reads it. It's in, it's in Greek, in modern Greek. Nicodemus of the Holy Mountain, who edit, was one of the editors of the Philokalia, wrote a commentary on all the canons for the great feasts. Oh, I did that. Three know. big volumes. That's what I use. And it's, it's, it's amazing. I mean, he, he, was, he was a scholar of, he knew the fathers so well that he could just look at um, a canon of, of John of Damascus and say, oh no, this bit comes from here, this bit comes from here, this bit comes from here. He just had this, I mean, he was a phenomenal scholar. Um, but, um, but more recently, what I think, which will, which will draw us into what we're talking about. I've been very interested in, in the fact, and I've written, written a, a lecture, but it's, it's, it's still sort of um, inchoate. Um, on the, John of Mars was treatment to the five elements of creation. Because um, after the section on God and the Trinity, before he talks about Christ, he talks about creation. It's the longest section in the book, at least in terms of chapters. And it's structured, it's the initial structure is round the fact that what God, first of all, when he created the world, he created the elements. And then out of the elements, he, 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 he created the humors and out of this created sentient life. And I just found it absolutely fascinating, simply that he takes this, it's, you can see it's all there in the fathers in some sort of way, but it's never presented so, so formally. You can pick it all out of um, Basil's uh, on the Exaimeron, but he doesn't, see, he doesn't present it like that. And this I found fascinating because for two reasons, um, one is that this is a, a good example of, of the way in which the fathers engage with what we would call the science of the day. Um, that's one point. The other point, though, is, is, is that many, many, many years ago, uh, when I was an undergraduate in Cambridge, I read Eddington's book, The Nature of the Physical World, or something like that. And there's a very famous bit in the first chapter. Um, which I remember because McKinnon, who was my professor in Cambridge, it was, he came back to it time and time again because he felt that it was incoherent and it was a very interesting incoherence. He said, look, if I look at this table, I think you've got a table made of wood, it's hard, it's got legs and so on, right. But that's not the real table. The real table mainly consists of nothing and, and electrical um, thing watches and uh, which we call um, protons and electrons and so on and that's what it really is um, and what so what really is there not is not what we think we see and McKenna said this is incoherent <laughs> it's incoherent because if you cut away what you actually see if you cut away your empirical evidence then you can't get to the theories that lead to believing that matter consists of 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 atoms which consist of um protons, neutrons, and electrons. You can't get to this theory without basing it on, on your empirical evidence. And you're, you don't actually perceive any of these electrons and stuff. What you perceive are bits of wood, sure. people, things. And this, this, this um, began to, I, 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 I started to read Bachelard on the elements as well. Well, he's doing something very different, but the, but the point of contact is this, that for John of Damascus and for Bachelard, the elements are something, a way of analyzing the world so that we feel we belong to it. Um, that, that the elements are not just, the elements are not just what is, what everything is made of, which is what they're understood, but the elements are also things that, that reverberate with certain kinds of experience. And this is what Bachelard brings out. Um, fire, water, earth, um, air. All of these 
uh, are metaphors for or certain kinds of experience. And so when we think about the world in terms of the elements, we're thinking about the world in terms of something that we experience, and we experience as being our world, the world to which we belong. And what Eddington does is give us a world, and he says this in fact, give us a world in which we feel completely alien. And that, that sort of, that contrast, I think is, is, is something that I, I I think is actually very, very important in trying to understand, um, yeah, understand the world in which we live. I don't, I, I, I um, there's been, there's, the progress of modern science has been on the one hand, um, a progress of greater and greater understanding leading to greater and greater control of the world in which we live. But on the other hand, it's been a process of forgetting the world in which we live. <laughs> and that the, and, and so, so a, lot of the pro, a lot of the problems are problems to do with the fact that we, we only pursue the kind of knowledge that can be quantified. And we push to one side a kind of knowledge that expresses itself in, 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 in metaphor and symbol. But the world of metaphor and symbol is actually probably more real as far as our lives are concerned, than, than be simply be able to control things. Um, and I think that, yeah. And that's why I want to, sort of, that's why I want to look more, I want to look more and more at, at the way in which the, the fathers understood um, the cosmos and the place of the human in the cosmos. I mean, that just the place of the human in the cosmos is essential to understanding what they thought about the cosmos. I mean, for all of them, in one way or another, man could be seen as some sort of little cosmos. The idea that you, you find in the time is. Some things, in, in different ways they understood this, but nonetheless, there's the idea, if you're going to understand the cosmos, you're understanding the human and vice versa. And Maximus has this um, in, in spades, as it were, that, that for Maximus, um, the human being um, is, is a model of the cosmos and the cosmos is a model of the human being and they fit together in the mystical I mean, his mystical year his sort of account in the of, of, of the of the liturgy this is prefaced by an understanding of the various different ways in which there are images within the Im images that, that reflect one another so that in the end of there you're wanting to say that that um that the human being as such the church as such the soul of the human being, the Bible, the cosmos, all of these manifest profound uh, analogies. And that you only really understand any of them if you understand how they relate. Now that's a way of understanding that is a very, very, very long way away from what we, modern scholarship thinks understanding is. Oh, definitely. Where you separate them off into little areas and then you, you, know, you, you, you and that's not, I'm not, I'm not decrying that. I'm just simply saying that, that we're in danger of missing something. And it's something that is very important. Yeah, if we forget- For our experience, but also for, for our understanding of the fathers because their mind uh, was organized and functioned symbolically by yeah. bringing things together, as you said, yeah. those images mirroring each other rather than uh, 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 dissociating uh, the items. Yeah. Well, symbol does actually mean throwing things together. Yep, definitely. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, that, th this is amazing, and uh, it's it's uh, uh, the best uh, opening <laughs> for the questions that I would uh, uh, would like to to ask you, um, uh, Father Andrew. You already mentioned the fact that uh, in uh, the patristic approach to uh, to reality, the cosmos, life, our own existence, um, there's this um, uh, combination uh, or accretion of information. It's not just uh, looking theologically and spiritually th uh, at things, it's also a matter of drawing on the available sciences. And this brings me to uh, a, not only the book that I hold in my hands, uh, but to your contribution to this book. So the book is the TNT Clark Handbook of Christian Theology and the Modern Sciences uh, for yeah. the readers to see. Uh, and chapter five here, 
uh, signed by Father Andrew uh, has to do with um, um, the fathers, uh, particularly uh, St. Basil the Great uh, and others, St. Theophilus of, of Antioch, uh, and their approach to creation in uh, various hexa, emerald uh, writings. And I would like to, to read the beginning of Father Andrew's chapter here, which I believe is, is very important for uh, our ongoing conversation here, uh, namely how to make sense of the sciences uh, in a Christian traditional uh, manner. Uh, but let me read. So this um, uh, passage is found at page 67. Father Andrew writes, when we think of problems of science and religion nowadays, there is a tendency, temptation, to think that these problems are ours, that they are new, and that consequently, there is nothing to be learned from earlier Christians, still less from the fathers. I jump a bit. Some of this is misconceived, I would argue. The result of our projecting back into past the kind of naive fundamentalism that we associate with those who want to reject modern science as in contradiction with the traditional belief of the church. We thus assume some kind of continuity between those who reject the findings of modern science and the thought of Christians who live before the era marked by a modern scientific understanding of the world. This seems a hazardous assumption that cuts us off from those before us who sought to understand the nature of the world from within their own thought world. Well, the bottom line to, to this passage uh, is that uh, there's nothing new in the uh, current conversations um, uh, antagonisms uh, and so on, clashes between uh, uh, partisans of uh, pure science, no religion, and the partisans of uh, pure faith, no science, and so on and so forth. And that uh, for uh, traditional Christians, there's a lot of wisdom that comes uh, from past ages, wisdom which uh, can still inspire, can still teach us ways of handling uh, these relevant matters uh, in ways that uh, not only bypass the idea of a conflict, of culture wars, uh, uh, but beyond this, uh, point to a constructive dialogue uh, which can lead to, um, well, perhaps a new way of handling things and a new way of uh, advancing uh, our civilization. Uh, Father Andrew, uh, would you like to comment on, on this topic? Um, and I'd be very much interested in knowing uh, what you think uh, would have prompted the early church theologians, the church fathers, uh, to engage, the science, engage in the sciences. Um, What's their methodology? What was their methodology? How did they handle such matters? Um, because I believe that these are very important topics. So on the one hand, they engage the sciences, and I want to know, uh, and I'm certain our audiences would like to know that too, why did they engage the sciences? And on the other hand, how did they do it? And how come they didn't um, arrive at uh, uh, antagonism and clashes? Can I just start by referring to another work that I wrote a bit earlier than that? Um, I was asked to contribute to a, a symposium in Durham called Reading Genesis, Reading Genesis After Darwin. And I was going to, I think I did, I think I did call my, my paper uh, Reading Genesis Before Darwin, but I, it was changed as a result of it. Um, and I, it was something about the fathers. But my point was simply this. One of the troubles about, about, um, about thinking about how people thought about how they related the world and their faith is that we tend to assume we know that the way people read the Bible before Darwin 
we can find we can find in those people nowadays who reject Darwin. So that we know that this sort of benighted way of looking at things was there for centuries, because that's before Darwin, and they can't have been and they can't have had Darwin's insights. But this is nonsense, because it seems to me that reading Genesis before Darwin, if you try and read what they wrote, you don't find a world of sort of benighted ignorance and hostility to the sciences. You find something quite different. Um, it's in some ways, from our perspective, maybe naive, but they didn't, they, they, they did, they, they, and I'm not just talking about the fathers, right up to, I think that the last great representative of this idea that all, all knowledge constitutes um, a kind of multifaceted um, um, single whole is that great work, The Anatomy of Melancholy by Robert Burton. No, great six volumes, huge thing, which is an analysis of what it is to be human, but does this by drawing on everything, including the very latest science of his day. He read Bacon, you know, you know all that sort of stuff, but he also he read all, all he, his knowledge of classical literature was total. He knew a great deal about the Middle Ages. He drew on everything he could because it all related. There was no reason to suppose that it wouldn't. So Homer could be just as important for understanding how we live in the world um, as Bacon, his contemporary. Uh, uh, if I may interrupt you, uh, something similar happened in, uh, in the 20th century uh, uh, with a number of um, uh, quantum physicists uh, mm -hmm. like um, uh, Heisenberg uh, yeah. and, uh, and David Bohm. Uh, who uh, quoted Heraclitus, for instance, uh, as uh, someone, an ancient philosopher whose intuitions uh, came very close to uh, what 20th century quantum physics would uh, discover about reality. Mm. But, to, but, to go, uh, um, but there is a difference, and, the di and, that, and what we've been talking about is really the difference, that when we talk nowadays about the relationship of science and religion, we have managed to persuade ourselves that these are two separate subjects. Um, you know, they are in different faculties in a university. They don't necessarily talk to one another. They, they, go, they do their own thing. And then there are some people who um, sort of try and relate them. But the, theology and science are two academic disciplines that is quite separate. I don't think it felt like that in the early centuries. And it didn't feel like that because science, meaning by that trying to understand the world in which we lived, uh, understanding it in terms of, I mean, even something like the elements, the four material elements, the four material elements all relate to one another. The only time they're mentioned as four in Basil Hetzimeron is to point out the way in which it, they, 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 they form a kind of cycle they, 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 they move one into another, they are not sort of, um, and this is for him a symbol of the way in which the world itself um, is, 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 is a unity. Um, but I don't think science for somebody like Basil was something that he would find out by going and talking to somebody who called himself a scientist. No, science is what he learned. It's what he'd, he'd learned as part of his education. It was, it was not, um, it was just part of what any really educated human being would know, or in practice, any educated upper class male might know. Though there were some famous women as well who knew this sort of stuff, but not so many. Um, and so I don't think that, that our sense that, there's, that there is a contrast between science and religion is not something that I think would ever have occurred to people like Basil as such. There are conflicts, but these conflicts are philosophical conflicts. I mean, there are some points, there are some, some of the philosophers um, believe, for instance, that human beings um, had really no freedom, that what happened to them happened as a result of the cosmos itself. The link between the human being and the cosmos was so great that you could find out what you were going to do by looking at the stars, because the stars and the constellations of the stars were part of this great whole that you belonged to, and you were not an exception to it. Um, and so um, people like Basil 
were quite clear that that's nonsense. That's complete nonsense. We are, we, lead, we rational beings are free. Um, the freedom may not be complete, and certainly it isn't complete, but it's complete enough. We don't, we don't make decisions because we are compelled to do these things by constellations of the stars, by fate. And one of the, it seems to be one of the, the, the if one looks at what are the sort of the constants in, 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 in patristic philosophical reflection, one of them is against fate. Fate, the idea that, that, that what we're going to do is, is determined by what has happened in the past or determined by what's going on in the stars. No, it's not. Um, um, there's that quotation, isn't there, from Julius Caesar about, um, our fate, dear Brutus, lies not in the stars, but in us that we are underlings. Um, I mean, Basil would agree with that, um, that we are in fact affected by things. We are affected by things because, um, because we are creatures, because we are weak, because we are frail. Um, things happen to us that we, that, that we are not in control of, but that's not the way things are meant to be. We are meant to be free, beings created in the image of God and through that image of God uh, manifesting a, a kind of um, sovereignty within the world. Um, that's what human beings are meant to be like. Um, if they're not, then it's something that we you know, need to examine. And there are, other, there are various other points. That, um, I, I, often this fatalism is tied up not so much with astrology, astrology but with, with materialism. And the idea that matter is the basic is the basic thing. Everything can be explained in terms of matter, um, and there's no reason to suppose that the, that the movements of little little atoms and things has got any meaning. Everything takes place after matos, um, and the fathers are quite clear that they don't agree with any of this. Um, fundamental for them. Um, is that man is created in the image, is the human is created in the image of God, and by being created in the image of God, um, he has a sort of sovereignty and a possible serenity in relation to um, his relations to other people. But this is something that needs to be cultivated. It's not something that is just, it's just a bare that, fact. Yeah. And it, so it seems to me that, 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 that a, 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 a real parallel between problems we have nowadays in relation to religion and sciences and problems um, in Basil's day will actually be issues like that. I mean, there, there is, there is, I think, in modern Western intellectual culture, a, a sort of vague convi a conviction that really everything can be explained in terms of um, what the sciences examine and what the sciences examine is what can be quantified and it's much easier to quantify things if they are material um, and so you only, have, you only have to read articles in um, you don't have to go to scientific american read articles in the times literary supplement or in the london review of books there is this over sort of this conviction that humans will explain everything and they will explain everything in terms of the, the, the brain, the brain will be seen to be a computer and all that sort of thing. But these are hopes that no, nobody's anywhere near, anywhere near proving any of this. But, the, but there's a sort of general feeling that this is where we're going, the direction we're going in. And people who think like that, it's very difficult to, um, to reason with them because, because what, they say it's not based on reason, it's based on a kind of faith in reason. Um, and that's very much the sort of line that Basil would be finding the same problem, the same sort of problem, maybe expressed in less, less, less sophisticated terms, but nonetheless, the point was, if you see everything as being material, then there's no reason to suppose that, um, that we are in, in command of our fate. So um, what, uh, so, yes, what determines uh, uh, his interest and uh, the interest of uh, of other uh, fathers uh, in uh, in the sciences was somehow uh, a polemical stance 
No, uh, I don't think it's fundamental. No, I think no, it's much more fundamental than that. The reason why they're interested in science is because they're educated Greeks. We're talking about educated Greeks who would 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 find wherever they looked in their literature a way of looking at the world that 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 that, that, that thought of the elements, thought of I mean the time is. Read the time is. The time is explains everything in terms of a cosmos that is very, very, very similar, to, is very similar to being human. And that seemed natural to them. The, the, there's a profound analogy between, <clears throat> I mean, in Plato, there are three, three things that which there are profound analogies between. There is the human being, there is the city, there is the cosmos. In the, in the Republic, what it concentrates on is 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 is, is, is drawing out these pa these parallels between how humans live together and how the human being is constituted. In the Timaeus, uh, this same sort of search for analogy um, is, is 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 applied in relation to the cosmos. And of course, in relation to the cosmos, um, Plato is quite clear that we cannot know anything because um, it belongs to the world of change and the world of change is not subject to knowledge in the proper sense of the word, episteme, as it were. Um, we, we can have guesses. We, we, can, we can tell a likely story, which yes. is, which, which is the, the work, what time is, time is the chap in the, in, the, in, in, the, um, in the dialogue says he's telling, it's a likely story. It couldn't be more than that because we're talking about a world of change. But nonetheless, this world of change is very, is what, how we experience change as human beings enables us to experience, to make some sense of the changes that we see and the relations that we see in the, in, in, in the cosmos. So I don't think this sort of religion and science as being a problem I don't think is there in the fathers because because um, the word for science, either in Greek or in Latin, would not apply to our knowledge of the world. It would apply to our knowledge of intellectual reality, which is stable and we can make sense of. That's why mathematics is so important for, um, for Plato, because mathematics deals with the world that is ideal. Unchangeable and triangles of triangles have got uh, they it, it got straight sides and the and the the um, the internal angles um, amount to to right angles. Um, well, you know most triangles that we draw are not like that. They haven't got straight sides. The everything is only approximate. But you can understand even these. You can understand these approximate um, triangles better by understanding the the ideal ones and trying to get the other way around. Yeah, when I said a uh, polemical stance, uh, I wasn't referring to this, let's call it uh, uh, likely account, which is still uh, uh, more uh, credible than uh, the myths uh, and the astrological tales. Uh, mm. I, 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 was, uh, I was meaning uh, a polemical approach to say astrology the topic of destiny fate and so on and so forth from a more purely scientific viewpoint i mean their encyclopedic formation their uh, training uh, that was uh, 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 across the disciplines not only theology or biblical studies equipped them basil and, and his peers equipped them with tools that allowed them to address topics like astrology, uh, horoscopes and all, all that um, from a variety of angles, scriptural, theological, but also scientific. So uh, when I said a polemical stance, I, I was meaning uh, an interest in the sciences uh, by contrast to uh, uh, the idea of uh, uh, folklore uh, or uh, pseudosciences like astrology. 
And in this case, we have an alliance. I think they were being anachronistic. The, the, the astrologists didn't think they were pseudoscientists. They thought they were people who really did understand and, and, and understood the way in which the constellations worked. They, um, the, the, I think it's very, very dangerous, I think, to, 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 it's very dangerous to bring our perspective too directly into this perspective of the patristic world. Um, what was wrong with astrology was, it was a moral objection, not a scientific objection. They objected to astrology because it, it led people astray. It led people to, to do things on the basis, uh, to, to, to give up their fate to something else. Yeah. But um, see, that, that's, that's the thing. Uh, in, in the case of uh, St. Basil's Exaimeron, uh, we see uh, how he deals with this matter from mm. a viewpoint that is, well, let's call it anachronistically, I give you that, Let, uh, let's call it scientific. So for, for him, astrology doesn't hold water, uh, not only because um, uh, our theology is against uh, the idea of lack of freedom, but also because uh, astrology is contradicted by whatever sciences were available at the time. And for me, that's very important for our understanding of how the sciences can be considered allies. I don't see it like that, I'm afraid. Okay. I, I, th I think that... Um, it seems to me that the way in which the time is explains the, the time is, is absolutely the basic text for understanding how people thought about the cosmos um, in our period and it was interpreted religiously for a start um, it told us about the way in which we fit into the into the cosmic world uh, into, into the world and the fathers really lapped this up i mean you you can uh, you you can when I was little, when I was younger, they used to talk about us, the, the stoicism of the fathers. The stoicism of the fathers was not to do with their, their behavior. It was the fact that they picked up the, the, this profound sense the Stoics had that the whole of the cosmos is a unity, that we belong. We be, that it, 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 almost, it was almost a, 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 a radical doctrine. The human being, because he is a human being, belongs with the stars, belongs with the cosmos. This is where we really belong. We can forget about the problems of fractious families and cities that, that, that go to war with one another and all of this. This is all, this is all unimportant or secondary to, what, is, to what, is, what, what belongs to nature, what belongs to thesis. And there, there, there are just two fundamental elements, the human being, and the cosmos. They belong together. Um, they are the things that are really real. The other things are problems of um, arrangements, convention, organization. Um, they're not so important. And the, the philosopher who sees this is able to remain tranquil, even in situations of, of, of great distress. Now, a lot of that feeds right into the Byzantine ascetic tradition the sort of life the monks were trying to lead, the way they thought about what the problems were of trying to leave the, lead a life of tranquility in which we could pray. Um, I, it seems to me that what's, what, I, I don't, it seems to me that, the, that it, there certainly is some selection. There are ideas that the fathers will accept and the ideas that they won't. But I don't think they can be, um, I don't think it's helpful for to to use our criterion, our criteria of the differences between what makes sense and what doesn't make sense. I mean, for instance, you know, we talk about astrology. Often, what we call astrology, they called astronomy, astronomia. And August, uh, yeah, uh, so, um, Plato always talks pretty well. Always talks about astronomia. I think um, Aristotle usually talks about astrologia. Um, astrologia um, um, meant not what we think of it. Astrologia meant somebody who understood the meaning of the stars, the logos, the meaning of the stars. Astronomia meant somebody who understood the nomos of the stars, the law of the stars. They're hardly different, 
really, if you think, if you, if you think of them like that, which is, and they thought in Greek, and that's the, the word they used. And it's, it's, um, I suppose the reason why I want to disagree with you is this. I, I, it seems to me that there's the, the combination of what we need to reject because it doesn't make sense and which perhaps we have a better sense of now than we did then. The, the contrast between that and, and what it is that we are making ourselves forget by making the scientific worldview the only worldview that contains truth. So a scientific worldview based on experiments, based essentially on what is quantifiable, because you can't do experiments very well without something to measure. Um, once, um, it seems to me that, that I don't want to say that um, there's this great worldview based on the time years and, the, and, and, and Genesis. Genesis read in the light of the time is and time is read in the light of Genesis, which is something we get in Basel. That 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 um, that this is this still contains a great deal um, that we are no longer able to perceive. Um, that, that we 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 um, we now understand the world in a, in a way which makes it strange to us, and if we do that, we are losing something because we do belong in this world. I mean, and yeah, you, you can you can you can sort of make the thing go right round. You just, look, the scientists understand the world because they apply to it what are essentially human inventions. I mean, mathematics is in some sense something that, uh, as 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 Vico said, it's it's a way of understanding the world humanly because we can do we can calculate humanly, um, and it, therefore it means that the world that we understand, the scientific world, is something that humans have generated, and so. If we find ourselves lost in the world that we have generated, something has gone seriously wrong. And the other way of seriously going wrong, which, which I, neither Vika nor Pascal would have thought of, is that, is that of course, if you, if you think in terms, essentially calculative terms of and analyzing the world, your, your, the reason that you're using is a calculative ratio. You, you, you can very, you, we have got to the point where, um, where something that is not alive can do it better than we can. The computer can do things that we can't do because we can't do them quickly enough. Um, so we got to the point where we're where in danger, it seems to me, of ceding to something which is simply a representative of only one aspect of reason, its ability to calculate. Ceding to that, um, the understanding of the world, but it can't understand. The computer can't understand anything. The computer can, the computer can do very, very quickly and very brilliantly, and 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 it it also raises things to another level. Um, the kind of calculations you can do on a, on a computer in a second, um, which a human it would take a sort of, you know, a team of human beings a year to do, means that you are actually able to under see things that you could, couldn't see before. And that is some sort of an advance, but you must still remember that it's a human advance. Um, we're not moving to an area where some non-human calculative faculty is regarded as God. We've created it. That's true. Uh, and uh, so if uh, I understood you correctly, uh, it's not prudent to uh, address upfront the idea of, of uh, uh, a polemical approach to uh, certain uh, aspects of, uh, of the culture of the time. And it's more a matter of uh, their own cultural uh, formation, their own cultural upbringing, with, uh, which brings together uh, aspects of a variety of viewpoints, disciplines, and so on and so forth in um, uh, or to, uh, envisaging uh, the, the formation of a worldview where there's room for ourselves, human beings, uh, where uh, we can perceive the harmony of things, 
uh, the order of things, including our own place within that order. Yeah. Um, but with this, I, 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 uh, I concur, I uh, fully concur. Um, would this uh, entail some kind of methodology? Because I believe that in, um, at least in, in uh, the current uh, conversations about uh, the usefulness of science for us Christians, um, those who adopt a negative approach to the sciences, uh, they say that uh, we, we can't actually use anything. Uh, uh, the sciences, uh, if they don't affect our Christian worldview, at least uh, leave us um, uh, indifferent, uh, that uh, we shouldn't engage the sciences, um, they cannot contribute uh, in any uh, significant ways to uh, our uh, understanding of the world. Um, I, think I think that's wrong. And I, tell, I, and if I, I give you a patristic example why. No, that, that's my question because I, 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 don't, I don't go uh, with, with that, uh, that solution. But, and I believe that look, in the tradition we have a very different approach. Look, you talk about ex haimal literature. Why is it so important? I mean, there are far more commentaries on, on Genesis 1 than on the rest of the Bible put together. I mean, it, it is just hugely important. Why is it so important? Because God created the world and therefore the world is something worth understanding. There's the thing that struck me about John of Damascus. John of Damascus sends 45 chapters looking at thing, looking, looking at before getting to Christ, looking at God's creation, what it consists of, what it evokes, what it what it means. Um, the creation more and more focuses on the human because the human is much more complex, he thought, than, than the rest of creation. I think we're beginning to see that in some ways this is, this is, this is wrong, that, that, that in fact, the whole of the created order has a, has a, has a complexity that is at least comparable with the, the, the complexity of the human being. But that, if John had known that, he'd been terribly pleased because, because really that's what he wants to believe, that the whole of the cosmos, the whole of the created order, um, has, has a complexity that we know from within as human beings. And I don't think you've been the slightest bit, I, mean, I read a wonderful review the other day about fungus. And the way in which fungus um, is, is it's normally complicated, it has ways of communicating very fast over large, vast distances. We just don't see it because we're not looking for it. But you know, the, 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 the funguses that you know, see on trees and things, they're part of a massive micro system. Um, um, and they can communicate. The idea that trees can communicate with one another actually begins to make sense. If you if you read some of this stuff on 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 on, on fungus, but I haven't read much of it. I read a review which sort of revealed a great deal. The, the, these revelations, I think, John would be find would be find fascinating. But the crucial thing is, it seems to me, is this: that the world that exists is created, and because it's created, it is of interest to us. We are created too, and if we're going to understand the world that God created, the cosmos that God created. Um, no part of it can be irrelevant. Um, but the thing I think that the, the, the thing that the, the danger it seems to we're in that now is that we've got a, a, if you like, a, an understanding of the cosmos that is that is hugely weighted in favour of what can be pursued by the, the experimental sciences. But the experimental sciences don't explain everything. Um, and they don't explain the person who is understanding what's going on. Um, and it seems so, I, 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 and I, I can, you can see this back in the fathers. The ex literature was so important because look, God's created this wonderful world. We want to know what it means. We want to understand how it works. Um, and the ex on itself has got uh, some of the sort of more fascinating bits. Um, which you've looked at yourself, uh, to do with the way in which you know, God on the second day creates light. 
doesn't create the sun and the moon and the stars until the fourth day. So what was this light doing if there were no light bearing bodies? What sort of a light was it? I mean, the, the, Basil sort of notices this. Gregory is fascinated by it. Um, I mean, it's that bit of, you know, uh, about Gregory on the Exameron that is usually sort of pretty dismissed as rather complicated speculations about something or other, you know. After he's sort of done the basic defending of Basil, he then goes off at the end of the, of the treatise to all sorts of complicated speculations about what's going on. They are terribly important, I think, because, because the Exameron points him to a fundamental distinction, which actually is, is seems to me, it's a fundamental distinction that, that, that was taken for granted by the Neoplatonists, not, I think, because of, of, of Genesis, but because of um, they had a kind of metaphysics of light. Um, but you see, all, like, what I really want to say is that the, the cosmos as a whole, which includes human beings and animals and everything else, all of this is, is of fundamental importance to us because it's God's creation. Um, we want to know about it. We need to know about it. Um, very, very important indeed. Uh, and you mentioned uh, Saint Gregory of Nyssa. Uh, I uh, uh, dealt with uh, his uh, uh, enigmatic uh, exameron uh, in a number of instances, and uh, I don't know if I I managed to uh, find my way yet <laughs> through that very complex treatise but as you said very important for uh, our understanding of how the fathers looked at, uh, at the cosmos um, and one um, uh, one thing that uh, uh, stands out for me is indeed his well let's call it metaphysics of light although this is very pretentious uh, but his approach to light his approach to light is 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 so smart uh, and in, he, he looks at uh, the light of the first day uh, and the light uh, of the fourth day uh, of the luminaries. And he says, well, these aren't two different lights. No, it's actually one light, but considered from two different viewpoints. And, and for me, this is uh, uh, the epitome of the patristic approach uh, to science and, and, and theology. Uh, he says, uh, when um, uh, Moses, the author of Genesis, traditionally speaking, uh, refers to the one light, the unified light uh, of, uh, of day one, uh, Imera Mia, uh, yeah. he presents there the viewpoint of God mm -hmm. or someone who looks at things from the viewpoint of God. In other words, a theological viewpoint. But then... Uh, when you look at uh, the days of creation uh, up to the fourth day when the luminaries appear in the narrative, mm -hmm. then uh, you look at sequences, at uh, stages of uh, development, he calls them. Yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that would be uh, a human viewpoint, he says, which uh, uh, to me means something that makes room for uh, scientific uh, information. And uh, from, from this viewpoint, his, his approach, his complex approach uh, to light from two viewpoints, divine and human, means uh, there's room for a theological consideration of the phenomena uh, and uh, a, let's call it scientific, philosophical, metaphysical, and so on and so forth approach to things. That, that's yeah. what I found so far. Well, that's what I mean. I think that, that, that that's, yeah, that, that, that's true. I, I think he's, well, as you say, I say, I think, I, two years ago, I read the best doctoral thesis I ever read in my life. Um, very, 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 very clever um, Greek um, priest called Sidros Katsos. And he argues that there is a metaphysics of light in the Capitations. In the way in which Biovelta spoke of the metaphysics of light in the, in the Neoplatonists. And it's demonstrated with, with um, immense care and learning. So, um, so I'm, I'm, I, I have to say that it's not my, these aren't my ideas, these are ideas that I've been, I've been convinced by. 
But they, they sort of, this seems to me to take you into the kind of world, um, the kind of world in which you can begin to see something of, you can see metaphor, so you can find metaphysical insights in the understanding of the creative order, which um, I think you only get glimpses of in modern scientific understanding because the modern scientific understanding really wants to bracket it off as it wants to bracket off the human being. Um, and um, the human being becomes the observer, and it can be any observer, so it's not a particular person. I mean, all, they sound, it, it sounds, you know, um, so it's objective because it looks the same to everybody, and that's the kind of thing. But of course, the, the world isn't like that. Um, um, some of, I'm going off on a tangent, but some of Florensky's, um, Pavel Florensky, the great, um, um, Polymath at the beginning of the 20th century, who was shot by the KGB in the 1930s. It's, um, he, his, his art trying to understand the icon is, is, is very interesting because he actually destroys the basis of the scientific method as it's usually understood. Because he points out the way in which we understand things as human beings is not an observer from in a particular point looking at something and seeing something. We move about. There is a mobile gaze, and it's the mobile gaze that the icon is trying to capture. The fact that we that, that what happens is that we we see reality. We do not just see photographic um, snapshots, which is in a kind of way what the the, the defenders of a, of a scientific method that is attempting to elide the observer. That's what they're doing. There is they elide everything that's important about perception and engagement, or particularly, they, they elide what is important about engagement with the world in which we live, and try to reduce it to perception. The fact that uh, that reality is practically not only something objective, but it's also something that emerges uh, at the crossing uh, between the subject, that is us, yeah. and the yes. object. Yeah. Well, well the, subject, the subject isn't, neither subject nor object are passive. Yeah. They both belong to a world. They they, they 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 engage with one with their environment with one another, and the percept our perception, um, our understanding really of what's going on needs to reflect this, and not just to reflect an idealized world in which objects are there and the subject could be anybody. And um, I Powell Frensky is endlessly fascinating. Yes. Um, yes. Uh, and, and, and listening to, to you uh, evoking uh, Florensky, uh, I, I was actually uh, uh, th thinking of, uh, uh, of the words that we traditionally use for revering the icons, uh, mm. proskinesis, uh, yes. which, which is actually a very dynamic term. You know, how come mm. they uh, came up with it? Proskinis is moving towards, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, engaging the icon uh, uh, makes you somehow, that, that's proskinis, engaging the icon, you know, moving it's towards, awesome. moving into, you know, it shows that you become part of, uh, of, of an event. Um, You're you are not a, a passive observer a positioned, I don't know where, uh, in an ivory tower and you look at reality without touching it. Reality is interaction. Mm. It's even stronger. You, 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 I think you've, you, you, you're hearing in your mind proskinesis with an iota between the clapper and the knee. It's not, it's an epsilon. Uh, I know that. <laughs> but that's kissing. Which kissing, is, that, okay. That suggests a real contact, not just sort of approaching. Yep, yep, that's engagement, <laughs> full contact. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I mean, the, the, the Latin calc of it is adoratio. And os, mouth is in the middle of that. Mm. Amazing. Anyway, I mean, I think, I think the, 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 what Ferensky discovered, or, or, or not discovered, what Ferensky made clear is that the, 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 there is a kind of metaphysics of the icon that 
we only really discovered, we only really discovered um, at the beginning of the 20th century or rediscovered. It must have been, it must have been there already, but nobody ever sort of bothered to explain it because it was just sort of taken for granted as part of a world in which lots of other things were taken for granted that we no longer take for granted. But um, um, Florensky is just, just, I've just been reading an article by Tarasov on it. He's amazing. And I think that, that all of these things are, are all part of, um, I think sometimes that, you know, we're living the, at, at the most exciting point in the history of humanity. Um, I wrote an article, which is, which is intended, it's a kite, uh, intending to sort of attract attention, and it will, I know, from some, but I, I argued that, that we are only for the first time beginning to understand Dionysus the architect, because we know he didn't write it. We know that it is it is a it is a um, it's not it's not a pseudonym. It's, it's a it, it's a um, it's an adopted name, an adopted name that comes with lots of presuppositions, and we can now grasp this and see what's going on. That, 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 that he's not talking about what he knows. He's talking about what any for anybody could know who who sort of began to. Get allow themselves to be caught up in the nature of the world as it is, and this article uh, is is intended to be um, provocative, let us say, but saying you know now because we understand that the judge of the Areopagus didn't write it, but it was written in his name by somebody from the sixth century, we are now in a position really to understand what he was doing. Hitherto, he's either been read, he's either been read as if he were writing in the 6th century, or later on, as if he was being, it was a forger in the 6th century, who pretended he was doing it. But we must get beyond, the, forgery is, is just the wrong term to use. This is somebody who wants to take on the mantle of Dionysus, the judge of the Areopagus, because this was the point at which Athens and Christianity met, Athens and Jerusalem met. Mm. I think that, and lots of things, I think lots of, I, in lots of ways, um, I think, I mean, you know, there's, there is so much that is going on that is deeply fascinating. It's not necessarily the sort of thing that, that attracts the academic theologians, but I think it, it, that we are in a very remarkable position at the moment to begin to understand um, yeah, you know, because we're, we're, the idea, of, the idea of taking on the idea that we see things from a perspective, but that we can adopt this change or alter this perspective, we can move around, we can, and this affects the way we know. Um, I mean, look, look, look back over the, the, the history of empirical philosophy from Locke onwards. And they've got no idea of this at all, but I don't. But they've forgotten something. It's not that nobody ever had this idea, but they've forgotten it. And want something that you know they can they can control. And what would be, Father Andrew? What would be uh, the lesson for us Christians of the twenty first century? Uh, a lesson that can be drawn from this renewed understanding of uh, the tremendous creativity of uh, of the early Christian centuries. Hmm. You know. What comes to mind is something that Gadamer says somewhere in Truth and Method, where he says that the, 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 the way in which the, the Enlightenment has been held, has, uh, is held to have shaken the basis of the way in which we read and understand has been hugely exaggerated. Um, that, that in fact, the, the traditional way, ooh, Oh dear. Sorry. I can. Uh... Yeah. Okay. Technical issues sorted. Uh, a last word of wisdom, uh, Father Andrew, for uh, this session. Yeah. I think. I mean, oh, what I think I want to say. What? What? Whatever. What I've been saying is summed up in. 
in in this, I think, that, that we need to take very seriously what was the most fundamental belief about the human um, in the um, in, in the in the, in the patristic Byzantine period, that we are created in the image of God. It is an idea that had already been um, adumbrated in um, classical philosophy, and particularly in Plato. Um, and the com combination of thinking through what it was meant to be in the image of God and, and the relation of the human to the cosmos by bringing together Genesis and the Timaeus um, is something that is still absolutely fundamental if we are not to um, lose, lose track of the fact of, lose track of, of the glory of being human, if you like. Um, if that makes sense. It does. And thank you, thank you very much. Uh, it has been a, a pleasure and an honor. Um, hopefully we can uh, catch up again at some point. I hope so, yes. I mean, there's lots more to say, I'm afraid, but we've, we've, we've done a bit, yes. Of course. Um, and uh, uh, thanking you once again, asking for your uh, blessing. Uh, I, I wish you uh, all the best, Father Andrew. Bye then. Thank you very much. It's been a very thank you. It's been a great, great conversation. Thank you. Thank you.